Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then you ain't black. Welcome back to the Battles of the American Civil War, which hosts Bang and Dang, or welcome to, if you're listening for the very first time, and if you are, we do a podcast about the Battles of the American Civil War, clearly, from the very start all the way up to the very finish, no battle is left unturned. Big or small, we do them all. Unless they're not on the uh, list of American Battlefield Association. <laughs> right. But either are we're already approaching the middle of 1864, and the Confederates are trying to hang on for their dear, dear lives. And now they're screwed because Grant has just taken over the whole army. And it's not looking good for them today. We have three different campaigns taking place. Uh, we got the Overland Campaign, the 100, what was it? The 100, uh, Bermuda 100 Campaign, and then a battle during the Atlanta Campaign, all taking place right. around the same time. We'll have the Battle of Yellow Tavern in the Overland, the Proctor's Creek in the Bermuda 100, and Rasaka in Atlanta. Rasaka. And, uh, that Rasaka one's gonna be our lengthiest battle of today. And, uh, I feel bad, uh, for the Confederates, nothing's going their way right now, man. Yeah. And, um, sp- not a spoiler alert, but our, what is it? Oh, yep, this first battle that we're going to do tonight, Battle of Yellow Tavern. Ooh, the uh, Confederates has possibly lost their best guy since um, old Stonewall himself. So mm, it happens. Yep, sure does. Yellow Tavern, Proctor's Creek, Rasaka. Before we get into it, go check out our YouTube app, Bang Dang Network. We post all of our other shows that we do. Outlaws and Gunslingers, Lee and Corey on the case. Plus our YouTube exclusive, Dart League. And if you just listen on Spotify or Apple, give us a review. Share us with your friends and answer that question on the Spotify. Ever that accompanies every episode on Spotify. First up, Battle of Yellow Tavern. That takes place May 11th. 1864 is part of the Overland Campaign. Um, Union Cavalry under Major General Philip Sheridan was detached from Grant's Army of the Potomac to conduct a raid on Richmond and challenge Confederate Cavalry Commander Major General Jeb Stewart. Jeb. The Overland Campaign was Union Lieutenant General Ulysses S. Grant's 1864 offensive against Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia to had fought in the inconclusive Battle of the Wilderness. Or maybe it's Pennsylvania Courthouse that's taking place right now. Either or. And they're engaged, yeah, they're engaged right now in the heavy fight in that battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse. Up to this point, Union Cavalry Commander Major General Philip Sheridan was dissatisfied with his role in the campaign. He's like, dude, I'm your best cavalry guy. What are you doing? Yes, he has been very, very sad. His cavalry corps was assigned to the Army of Potomac under Major General George G. Meade, who reported to Ulysses S. Grant. Meade had employed Sheridan's forces primarily in the traditional role of screening and reconnaissance. Whereas Sheridan saw the value of wielding the Cavalry Corps as an independently operating offensive weapon for wide range and raids into the rear areas of the enemy. He wanted to be like, oh, he, he wanted to go around. On a May 8, 1864, one of the worst days ever in American history, <laughs> Sheridan went over Meade's head and told Grant, that if his cavalry corps were let loose to operate as an independent unit, he could defeat Jeb Stuart, long and nemesis to the Union Army. Yeah. Grant was intrigued, and he convinced Meade of the value of Sheridan's request. Well, that very next day, May 9th, the most powerful cavalry force ever seen in the Eastern Theater. So over 10,000 troops with 32 artillery pieces rode to the southeast to move behind Lee's army. All right. They had three goals. First, and most important, defeat Stuart. No shit. Second, disrupt Lee's supply lines by destroying railroad tracks and supplies. And third, threaten the Confederate capital in Richmond, which would distract Lee and hopefully get Grant to finally take this army of Northern Virginia out, which has been tried by seven different commanders of the Potomac so far. The Union Cavalry Column, which at its time stretched over over 13 miles. It reached the old Rebel Forward supply base at Beaver Dam Station that evening. The old Rebs troops had been able to destroy many of the critical military supplies before the Union arrived. So Sheridan's men destroyed numerous railroad cars, six locomotives of the Virginia Railroad System, or the Virginia Central Railroad. Destroyed telegraph telegraph wires as well, and they also rescued almost 400 Union soldiers 
who had been captured in the Battle of the Wilderness. Look at that. Yeah, look at that. Good for them. Uh, Stewart moved his 4,500 troopers to get between Sheridan and Richmond. Two forces met at noon, May 11th, at Yellow Tavern, which was an abandoned inn located six miles north of Richmond, which is present-day location at the intersection of Mountain Road, Brook Road, and Telegraph Road. Oh. Coordinates, whatever. <laughs> Not only did the Union outnumber the Confederates by three divisions to two brigades, they had superior firepower, and all were armed with rapid-fire and Spencer carbines. Really? <laughs> oh, man. The old Rebs tenaciously resisted from the low ridgeline bordering the road to Richmond. Fighting for over three hours, a counter charge by the 1st Virginia Cavalry pushed the advancing Union troopers back from the hilltop as Stuart mounted on horseback and shouted encouragement. As the old 5th Mission Cavalry streamed in the retreat past Stuart, a dismounted Union private, 44-year-old John A. Huff, a former shopshooter, turned and shot Stuart with his 44 caliber revolver from a distance of about 10 to 30 yards. The large caliber round cut through Stuart's abdomen and exited an inch to the right of his spine. Stuart fell into the arms of Company K's commander, Gus Dorsey. Dorsey called him and took him from his horse. Stuart told him, Dorsey, save your men. Dorsey refused to leave uh, Jeb Stuart and brought him to the rear. Ooh, man. Stuart suffered, suffered great pain as an ambulance took him to Richmond to await his wife's arrival at the home of Dr. Charles Brewer, who was his brother-in-law. As he was being driven from the field in an ambulance wagon, Stuart noticed disorganized ranks of retreating men and called out to them his last words on the battlefield. Go back, go back, and do your duty as I have done mine, and our country will be safe. Go back, go back. I'd rather die than be whipped. Mm, Jeez. Stuart ordered his sword and spurs be given to his son. As his aide, Major Mm -hmm. McLennan, left his side, Confederate President Jefferson Davis came in, took General Stuart's hand, and asked, General, how do you feel? Stuart answered, easy, but willing to die. If God and my country think I have fulfilled my destiny and done my duty. His last whispered words were, I am resigned. God's will be done. He died 7.38 p.m., 12th of May, 1864. Uh, that was the next day. Before Flora Stewart reached his side, oh, mm-hmm. he was only 31 years old, old Jeb Stewart. Wow, he man. Looked like he was 50. Right. Stewart was buried in Richmond's Hollywood Cemetery. Upon learning of Stewart's death, General Lee is reported to have said that he could hardly keep from weeping at the mere mention of Stewart's name and that Stewart had never given him a bad piece of info. Huff, he was moitered himself, though. The moitered of uh, Stewart is moitered himself at the Battle of Hall shop a few weeks later. The fighting kept up for about an hour after Stuart was wounded, with Major General Fitzhugh Lee taking temporary command. Damn, dude. Mm. Bye-bye, bye-bye, Jebby. Well, so careless, dude. Just out of nowhere. Well, shout out to Huff, though. Right? Just running past him. was like, all right, there's that motherfucker right there. Bam! In the larger picture, Sheridan's raid proved to be a costly mistake. Chasing Stuart was another sideshow for the campaign, which would be decided by what the armies did at Spotsylvania. By abandoning the main theater conflict to pursue his whimsical raid south, oh. Sheridan deprived Grant of an important resource. Uh-oh. His victory at Yellow Tavern offered scant solace to the blue-clad, blue-clad soldiers hunkering in trenches above the courthouse town. Sheridan's absence hurt Grant at Spotsylvania in much the same way that Stewart's absence from Gettysburg had uh, a handicap lead. That's true. Mm. Well, I mean, <laughs> shit, though. What are you going to take? Yeah, you might have lost Spotsylvania's courthouse, but uh, a major right. major player on the other side is now dead. Gone. Wow. The Union cavalrymen suffered 625 casualties, but they captured 300 old ribs and recovered almost 400 Union prisoners. How does that work out? Sheridan disengaged his men and headed south towards Richmond. Although tempted to the boys through the modest defenses to the north of the city, they continued south across the oh. Chickahominy the Chickahominy River to link up with Major General Benjamin Butler's force on the James's River. After resupplying with Butler, Sheridan's men returned to join Grant at Chesterfield Station on the 24th of May. Sheridan's raid achieved a victory against a numerically inferior opponent at Yellow Tavern, but accomplished little overall. Their most significant achievement was killing old Jeb Stewart, which deprived Robert E. Lee of the most experienced cavalry commander of all time. But this came out at the expense of two-week period in which the Army of Potomac had no direct cavalry coverage for screening or reconnaissance. Yeah, that's not good. But Mm -mm. hey, man, I'll take I'll take uh, taking out Jeb Stewart over that. 
they, they can uh, manage. Yeah. Wow. Oh, Jeb, dude. It's always they're always getting killed, with the exception of uh, Stonewall, which Chancellorsville was a pretty major battle. Right. But these little guys right here. Oh, who was it last week? Or the week before. Oh, yeah. What's his name from the Union got yeah. killed, and he was uh, Sedgwick or something like that. And he was a big guy, but that was not even a big battle. No. Crazy. It's crazy stuff. <laughs> That's going to move us on to the Battle of Proctor's Creek, which is also referred to as Drury's Bluff or Fort Darling. Mm-hmm. Fought May 12th to the 16th, 1864, Chesterfield County, Virginia, which is during the Bermuda 100 campaign. Uh, after his repulse at Swift Creek and Fort Clifton, May 9th, Union Jam Major General Benjamin Butler withdrew into his entrenchments at the Bermuda 100. A Confederate army of 18,000 was patched together under the command of PGT Beauregard, General that is, to confront Butler's 30,000. Mm. On May 12th, Butler moved north against the Confederate line at Drury's Bluff, but again adopted a defensive posture when his attack was not supported by gunboats. Still, you got 12,000 more men. I always see him. Oh, that goes. Jeez. Uh, 13th of May, a Union column struck the right flank of the old Reb line at the Woodridge House, carrying a line of works. Butler remained cautious, however, giving Beauregard time to concentrate his forces. Of course. Butler, don't you learn? <laughs> no. That you get attacked, man. On the 16th of May at dawn, Major General Robert Ransom's uh, Confederate Division opened an attack on Butler's right flank, routing many units. Subsequent attack lost direction in the fog, but the federals were the federal allies were disorganized and demoralized. Mm, the two D's. Mm. After severe fight, and Butler ex- extricated himself from battle, withdrawing again to his Bermuda Hundred line. A pussy. There were approximately six thousand six hundred casualties. Jesus. This battle stopped Butler's offensive against Richmond. The battlefield is now part of the Richmond National Battlefield Park. Okay. Dude, the Richmond National Battlefield Park, how freaking huge is that? I bet. Butler's terrible here. Yeah, Butler's not very good at all, overall. He should easily route these guys. Oh, you would think. You know, I'm going to be a defensive guy because I don't have gunboats. Who gives a shit? Oh, I don't have gunboats. Stupid. It's going to move us to the last and biggest, or longest uh in terms of information battle of the day which is the battle of Rosaka. we're going all the way back down towards uh georgia georgia atlanta campaign may 13th to the 15th under william tecumseh sherman engaged uh confederate army of tennessee led by joseph e johnston oh. april 30th shoyman oh, we're gonna hear that a lot um <clears throat> we're, we're gonna hear that a lot in the next 10 15 minutes guys so prepare yourself <laughs> Uh, he commanded the military division of the Mississippi, gathered a field army numbering 110,000 soldiers, Ooh-wee. of which 99,000 were available for offensive purposes. Oh, damn. All of the Union Army's 254 guns consisted of 12-pounder Napoleons, 12-pounder Parrot rifles, or 10-pounder Parrot rifles, my bad, 20-pounder Parrot rifles, and 3-inch ordnance rifles. They got some shit. Mm. Tear some shit up. 25,000 non-combatants accompanying the army included railroad employees and repair crews. Teamsters, medical staff, black camp servants. Slaves. <laughs> uh, General Schoenman directed the elements of three armies. The Army of the Cumberland, led by George H. Thomas. They mustered 60,000 troops, 130 guns. Army of Tennessee, under James McPherson. They had 25,096 guns. And the Army of Ohio, commanded by John Schofield. Schofield, but yeah. Yep. Schofield, uh, 14,000 men, 28 guns. And El Shoyman had 110,000 total troops. Yes, he did. Well, yeah. Thomas's army was made up of the 4th Corps under Oliver Otis Howard, the 14th Corps under John M. Palmer, the 20th Corps under Joseph Hooker, hey. and three cavalry divisions led by Edward M. McCook, Kenner Garrard, and Hugh Judson Kilpatrick. All right. McPherson's army consisted of the 15th Corps under John A. Logan and the left wing of the 16th Corps under Gren- Grenville M. Dodge. He had the 17th Corps under Francis Preston Blair Jr., but he would not join until the June 8th. Wow. Schofield's army was made up of the 23rd Corps under Schofield and a cavalry division led by George Stoneman. The 4th and 20th Corps uh, each numbered 20,000. The 14th Corps totaled 22,000. The 15th Corps had 11,500, while the 26th and the 27th each counted about 10,000. 
that it would be the 16th and the uh, 17th, not the 26th and the 27th. Johnston's Army of Tennessee include two infantry corps, led by William J. Hardy <laughs> and John Bell Hood. And a Calvary Corps under Joseph Wheeler. Why are these guys stuck down in Tennessee? Bring these guys up to the Potomac. I mean. Right. Army was soon joined by the Corps of Leonidas Polk. We haven't heard him in a while. And a Calvary Division of William Jackson, which was sometimes called the Army of the Mississippi. Hardy's Corps included divisions of Benjamin Cheatham, Patrick Claiborne, William H. D. Walker, and William Bate. Hood's Corps uh, comprised of divisions from Thomas Hinman, Carter Stevenson, and Alexander Stewart. Do they, not, do they not name their divisions, or we just don't, right. uh, history just don't care they to don't name care. them, I guess. Polk's Corps consisted of divisions of William Loring and Samuel French and James Canty. All right, well, April 20th, Johnson's Army of Tennessee reported 41,279 infantry, 8,436 cavalry, 3,227 artillery men serving 144 guns. Ooh. We had Hugh W. Mercer's Brigade of 2,800 from the Atlantic Coast on May 2nd. Uh, Canty's Division of 5,300 from Mobile, Alabama on May 7th. Lauren's Division, 5,145 from Mississippi on May 10th to the 12th. French's Detachment of 550 on May 12th. Jackson's Cavalry of 4,477 on May 17th. And French's Division of 4,174 on May 19th. Other units arrived at a later date. <laughs> <laughs> there are about 8,000 non-combatants supporting the Army, many of whom were men unfit for combat. Johnson had... Almost 70,000 troops after Polk's Corps joined. Mm. So we got 70 to 110, huh? This uh, is where you just need to blow your guys to these guys. Yeah, Fuck it, it dude. You're, come on. Grant, General-in-Chief of the Union Army, ordered Sherman to move against Johnson's army to break it up and to get into the interior of the enemy's country as far as you can, inflicting all the damage you can against their war resources, quote, end quote. Repeat the line. Rather than break up the Confederate Army, Sherman planned to drive it back to Atlanta. Since Atlanta was a critical Confederate railroad supply and manufacturing center, Sherman chose it as his objective. He also assumed that Grant's operations against Robert E. Lee in the Eastern Theater would be the primary campaign and that his operations in the Western Theater would be secondary. Right. But they're kind of mostly both equal. Right. One thing both Grant and Sherman agreed on was that Johnson must not allow to... Uh, he must not be allowed to reinforce Lee in the east. No. He said, you keep those guys down here. Sherman's first task was to gather enough supplies at his Chattanooga forward base to supply 100,000 soldiers mm. and 35,000 horses for 70 days. Damn. That way, if the Confederates blocked the railroad between Nashville and Chattanooga, his Union troops would still be able to campaign. Yeah. Get that shit going. Sherman solved this problem by confiscating rolling stock from the Louisville-Nashville Railroad and two smaller railroads. But also prior to prioritizing military use of all railroads, uh, he accumulated ample supplies by the end of April. Good for him. Right. The Western Atlantic Railroad connected Chattanooga with Atlanta and also supplied Johnson's Army at Dalton. Mm. Shoyman's 2,000-man railroad repair organization was led by none other than, you guessed it, William Weirman Wright. WWW. Yeah. Originally, Sherman planned to have McPherson's Army thrust across the northeast corner of Alabama in the direction of Rome, Georgia. However... He found that the tw the Seventeenth Corps was still at Cairo, Illinois. Oh no! Oh, geez. And Andrew Jackson Smith's two divisions also could not be used. Oh shit! Therefore, Sherman planned to use McPherson's twenty three thousand men to execute a plan proposed by Thomas, namely to march through Snake Creek Gap and wreck the Western and Atlantic Railroad at Resaca. Mm. Then Sherman wanted McPherson to withdraw to the Gap. Okay, sounds like fun. Meanwhile, Sherman wanted the armies of Thomas and Schofield to push the old Rebs uh, frontly. Frontally. <laughs> With the railroad cut, he expected Johnson to retreat, whereupon McPherson would emerge from the gap again to strike Johnson from the west while Thomas and Schofield attacked from the north. In early April, the old Rebs government in Richmond wanted to Johnson to take the offensive against the old Union troops opposed to him. Johnson asked for reinforcements, but they're like, no, we want you to do with what you got. <laughs> right. President Jefferson Davis is like, no. <laughs> they're like, we, no, we want you to go on offensive, like, but we don't have enough men. I don't care. I don't care. It's, I need these for my escape. Gee, right. <laughs> uh, Davis expected the main Union offensive to be in the East and believed that the Union Army did not have the strength to mount major offenses in both the East and West. Jefferson Davis was terrible. What an idiot. When Wheeler reported with near accuracy that Sherman had 103,000 soldiers, Davis and his military advisor Braxton Bragg refused to believe it. Oh, Bragg, Bragg usually you're decent. Well, you're well, not no more. Bragg asserted that Sherman had no more than 70,000. Oh, bullshit. Including a field force of only 60,000. Mm. 
Davis did not trust Johnston, but he felt that he could not replace him on the eve of the campaign. He's your maybe best, uh, general now. Maybe, well, besides Lee, obviously. Uh, maybe we can't and trust Bragg. you, Davis. And Bragg. Bragg's uh, similar to what Halleck is right now. Right. He's not even out there. Jeez. When Jefferson Davis awoke to the danger of showing posed to Georgia, he authorized Polk to send Lawrence <laughs> Division from <laughs> yeah, Mississippi. Yeah, wait a minute. Maybe it was right. right. And then also an infantry brigade from Mobile. Uh, Polk exceeded his orders by ordering French's division and Jackson's cavalry to move from Mississippi to Georgia and by going there himself. Look at you. 3rd of May, Sherman's forces were in motion. 7th of May, Palmer's 14th Corps marched southeast from Ringgold to Tunnel Hill. Howard's uh, 4th Corps marched from Catoosa Springs to support the 14th Corps. And O. Hooker's 20th Corps it marched southeast from Lee and Gordon Mill toward Mill Creek Gap and Rocky Face Ridge. All right. Now, Schofield's 23rd Corps marched... Hey, yo, Mick. Right? Yo, Mick. Look at my face. It's on that Rocky Ridge. (laughs) (laughs) It's on the ridge. I'm right. (laughs) (laughs) Schofield's 23rd Corps marched southwest from Red Clay to connect with the 4th Corps near Catoosa Catoosa Springs. McCook's cavalry was at Varnell Station on Sherman's left flank. McPherson's army marched south southeast from Lee and Gordon Mill to Ships Gap and then east to Villanelle. Garrard's cavalry division was supposed to lead McPherson's columns, but it was delayed. Mm. Sherman ordered the offensive to begin without it and said, fuck it, we ain't got time. May 8th in the Battle of Rocky Ridge Ridge. <laughs> <laughs> May 8th, in the Battle of Rocky Face Ridge, the 4th Corps Brigade of Charles Garrison Harker seized the northern tip of the ridge and other units moved up to Buzzard Roost Pass. Hmm. Well, at Doug Gap, about six miles south, John W. Geary's 20th Corps uh, tried to force its way. 20th Corps Division. Right. Tried to force its way through the ridge, but it failed. However, these actions were designed to divert Johnson's attention from McPherson. In fact, Wheeler's cavalry detected McPherson's column, but Johnston was convinced that it was headed for Rome. Mm. Johnston ordered that Lawrence Division march to Rome from Alabama and that William T. Martin's cavalry division should go there as well. Meanwhile, James Canty's brigade arrived at Resaca. At Foist, Johnson ordered it to march to Dalton, but <laughs> reconsidered and re- instructed it to stay at Resaca. After a 20-mile march, May 9th, the 16th Corps Division of Thomas W. Sweeney passed through the four-mile-long gorge of Snake Creek Gap and reached its southern exit. The other 16th Corps Division of James C. Vietch, <laughs> a little Vietch, <laughs> and uh, two 15th Corps Divisions marched as far as the northern end of the gap that evening. The 3rd 15th Corps Division was guarding the wagon train and Garrard's cavalry was still distant. Sherman directed Kilpatrick to assist McPherson by sending a cavalry brigade. McPherson let Sherman know that he was in Snake Creek Gap and issued orders to advance to Resaca the next morning. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Well, Claiborne, he later wrote that Johnson's chief of staff, William McCall, McCall, he told him that the gap was undefended because of a flagrant disobedience to orders. Anybody did not name the guilty party. <laughs> it was probably him. All right. <laughs> On the night of 9th of May, Canty reported to Johnston that Calvary sighted at Union troops near Villanau. Therefore, Johnston ordered J. Warren Grisby's cavalry to occupy Snake Creek Gap. As Grisby's troopers approached the gap at mid-morning of the 10th of May, they encountered McPherson's advance elements, the 9th Illinois Mounted Infantry and the 66th Illinois Infantry Regiments. All right, well, Grigsby immediately ordered his cavalrymen to delay the Union advance towards Wasaka. By 2 p.m., Dodge's two 16th Corps divisions reached the crossroads about two miles west of Wasaka. Uh-oh. Leaving VH's division to, <laughs> to watch the road from the north, Dodge pressed on with Sweeney's division and routed a 1,400-man Confederate force <laughs> defending Bald Hill. Really? Canty had only 4,000 men to defend Wasaka, including Grigsby's cavalry, mm. though. The Confederate force included a brigade under Daniel H. Reynolds and two four-gun batteries armed with 12-pounder Napoleons. Meanwhile, uh, Reynolds' brigade was at Doug Gap. Oh, cool for Doug. And his Gap. <laughs> 4 p.m., Logan's two divisions reached the crossroads, releasing Viatch's division. <laughs> Viatch's men crossed Camp Creek on Sweeney's left and approached the railroad. Meanwhile, Sweeney's division pressed forward. Would it be Veach? <laughs> Maybe. And got within 200 yards of the railroad. McPherson, he worried that he was walking into a trap. He recalled both Dodge's divisions and marched his command back to Snake Creek Gap. After losing six, killed 30 wounded and 16 captured. 
His orders were to break the railroad, but all his troops accomplished was to cut down some telegraph wire. Right. That works. Right. May 9th, Thomas and Schofield sent skirmish lines to probe the Confederate defenses on Rocky Face Ridge. Johnson deployed Hardy's Corps on the left and Hood's on the right. Only Harker's brigade pressed its attack, but it was repulsed. Oh. When reports of Union forces at Snake, Gra- at Snake Creek Gap reached Johnston, the Confederate commander sent the divisions of Claiborne and Walker to Tilton, which was north of Rosaka. May 10th, Sherman learned McPherson had failed to cut the railroad and immediately sent Hooker's 20th Corps to join him at the Gap of Snake Creek. Right. Leaving Howard's 4th Corps in the front of Rocky Face Ridge, he then followed Hooker with the rest of the army. Though. All right. All right. Said, well, Don't leave me alone. All right. May 11th, Polk reached Rosaka with Lawrence's division. The very next day, Palmer and Schofield's Corps followed, while Johnston evacuated Dalton that night and marched his troops south to Rosaka. On the afternoon of 12th of May, 1864, Sherman arrived at McPherson's headquarters. The first words he said to his subordinate were, Well, Mac, you have missed the opportunity of a lifetime. <laughs> Later that day, Thomas also arrived and informed Sherman that Johnston's wagon train was sighted moving south toward Rosaka, indicating that the old Rebs were probably retreating. Well, then Sherman ordered the 14th Corps to hurry up, and that formation hiked through Snake Creek Gap that night. Howard's 4th Corps and the Stillman's Cavalry Division, which had finally arrived at the front, occupied Dalton on the morning of May 13th. Howard notified Sherman at 9 a.m. that Dalton was evacuated via a temporary telegraph line strung between his headquarters and McPherson's. Oh. In the morning, Sherman's forces advanced toward Rosaka, getting within two miles by 10 a.m. All right. Seemed Seemed to work out. Oh, uh, Kilpatrick of the Union. He led his cavalry on a reconnaissance and was wounded soon afterward. Logan's 15th Corps deployed with Viach's 16th Corps and on its right. Division. Right. And elements of the 20th Corps on its left. And at 1 p.m. began pressing back Confederate skirmishers. By 4.30 p.m., Logan's troops drove the old Rebs from Bald Hill and confronted a heavily defended line of entrenchments outside of Rosaka. <laughs> By the evening of 13th May, Scheumann's forces were aligned, but from right to left, as follows. You got Biatch's division, Logan's Corps, Daniel Butterfield's 20th Corps division with the other two 20 Corps divisions in reserve, and Palmer's 14th Corps. We also had two of Schofield's 23rd Corps divisions behind the 14th Corps, while the 3rd Division, Alvin Peterson Hovey's, guarded Snake Creek Gap. Ooh. Sweeney's 16th Corps division was west of Rosaka. Garage Cavalry Division was near Villanelle, and Kilpatrick's Cavalry, temporarily led by Eli Long, watched the north bank of the Ustanala River. All right. The Union forces were confronted by the bulk of Johnson's army. Only the divisions of Bate, Hinman, and Stewart were still marching from Dalton and reached Rosaka that evening. Uh-oh. Okay, so you got Stoneman and McCook's Cavalry and Howard's 4th Corps. They pushed south from Dalton, slowed by Wheeler's effective delaying tactics. Johnston deployed Polk's Corps on the Confederate left flank. Facing west with his left, resting on the Asanukalala, <laughs> the Ustanala. Hardy's Corps held the center, also facing west. Hood's Corps defended the right flank, facing to the north, with his right touching the Conestoga River. Part of Walker's division was in reserve, while the other part was at Calhoun, farther south. Cool. Right. Sherman thought that Johnson intended to retreat from Rosaka, a belief strengthened by seeing the Confederate wagon train crossing to the south bank of the Ustanala. In fact, Johnson hoped Sherman would attack him and offer the chance to deal the Union Army a counterblow. Right. Sherman ordered up his Cumberland pontoon so that Kilpatrick's cavalry could cross the Ustanala and damage the railroad. Uh Uh-oh. He also wanted Garage cavalry to cross and move toward Rome. All right. Meanwhile, Sherman wanted the Union infantry to attack so that Johnson would be unable to stop Kilpatrick and Garrard. Oh, shit. Okay, got some plans. Well, Thomas suggested that sending McPherson's army and Hooker's Corps across the Ostinosa to be in position to interfere with a possible Confederate retreat. He's like, we can do it. Show him and we rejected that <laughs> idea. Nope. The pontoons arrived on the morning of 14th of May, and they were at Lay's Ferry on the Ustanala a few hours later. During the morning at Sherman's behest, uh, McPherson orders Sweeney's division to cross the Ustanala and for Garrard to march to Rome. When Howard's 4th Corps arrived from the north at about 11 a.m., Scheumann ordered Palmer's 14th Corps and Schofield's 23rd Corps on Palmer's left. He said, advance. Advance out there. Sherman believed they were striking the Confederate right flank. In fact, the Union troops were unwittingly attacking the Confederate right center. Oh, 
The Union soldiers blundered through heavy underbrush and suddenly confronted Confederate entrenchments on the east side of Camp Creek. Henry M. Judah's 23 Corps Division recklessly charged, Uh-oh. ran into a tense rifle and cannon fire, and was bloodily repulsed. I bet. On Judah's, le- Judah's left, Cox's 23rd Corps Division encountered an advanced line of rifle pits and seized them after a bitter struggle, though. Oh, okay. All right. Well, then you got Judah's right, which is Al- Absalom Baird's 14th Corps, uh, was quickly torn back by heavy fire after suffering 135 casualties. By 3 p.m., Judah's division lost 700 killed or wounded, while Cox's troops sustained losses of 66 moited and 486 wounded. Jeez. Subsequently, Union artillery unlimbered and took the Confederate lines under a withering bombardment. About 4 p.m., Johnston noticed that David Stanley's division of Howard's Corps had his left flank exposed and ordered Hood to attack. 5 p.m., the divisions of Stewart and Stevenson advance, supported by three brigades from Walker's division and one brigade from Lauren's division, and the Rebs were on the move. Now, old Stanley, in a, in, a, in a pinch, called for help. He formed his division into a long, thin line and posted Peter Simonson's 5th Indiana Battery on the extreme left flank. Howard asked for reinforcements, and a division of Alpheus S. Williams from Hooker's Corps was sent. Mm. Stevenson soldiers overwhelmed Stanley's two left brigades, but when they tried to overrun the 5th Indiana Battery, they were driven back by a deadly fire from its six M1857 12-pounder Napoleons and three-inch ordnance rifles. Oh, mm. deadly. Ooh. Stevenson's division tried a second attack and was repulsed by some of Stanley's rallied Union infantry and a close-range blast of a double canister shot from the cannons. By the time the old Rebs attempted a third attack, Williams' division arrived and repelled it with heavy losses. Stevenson's right. Stewart's division moved too far to the right and never made contact with the Union flank. Oh. You idiots. During the afternoon, Peter Joseph Osterhaus detected weakness in the Confederate skirmish line and pushed the 12th Missouri Infantry forward. The regiment captured the bridge over Camp Creek and entrenched the position, protecting the span. 5 p.m., McPherson became aware that the Confederates opposing him were sending troops to the north. Oh. Determined to stop the transfer of more troops, he ordered two 15th Corps brigades to seize a hill on the other side of Camp Creek. Oh. Charles Woods blows every day. Uh, <laughs> Charles Woods? No, Charles. Rogers. Rogers, right. Uh, Charles Woods' brigade from Osterhaus's division and Giles Alexander Smith's brigade from Morgan Lewis Smith's division crossed the creek and captured that that very hill they wanted oh, to. Oh, fantastic. Look at the north. Good for them. Doing stuff, huh? 7.30 p.m., Canty's division, Alfred Jefferson Vaughn's Jr.'s brigade. They tried three times to retake that very hill, but failed in the face of cannon projectiles from Lois Volker's Battery F, the 2nd Missouri, and rifle fire. Because artillery placed on the hill could hit the railroad and wagon bridges, Johnston ordered a pontoon bridge to be placed out of cannon range. At Lay's Ferry... Sweeney's division managed a successful assault crossing the Ustanala. However, after receiving a report they owe Rebs were building a bridge upstream, Sweeney withdrew from his bridgehead. Why? Go attack those sons of bitches. They're busy building a bridge. Right. On May 15th, Sherman ordered Howard's and Hooker's Corps to attack from the north and drive towards Wasaka. McPherson was directed to hold his ground in the expectation that he would be attacked. Palmer's Corps was also ordered to hold its ground. All right. Schofield was instructed to pull his corps out of line and move it to the left flank. Oh. Johnson originally planned to attack the federal left flank again, but canceled that plan when he heard that Union forces had bridged the Usanala and was gained. Uh, they gained a foothold in Polk's defenses. He's like, no, can't do that now. We're about to be overrun here, boys. You ain't kidding. During that morning, the only action occurred when some of Stoneman's cavalry crossed the Kanasaga and overran a old rebel hospital before being chased away. 1 p.m., Howard launched his attack and was immediately repulsed by intense rifle and cannon fire. Only general reported that his brigade, one general reported that his brigade suffered 120 casualties in 30 seconds Jeez. before the survivors were ordered to retreat. Union Brigade Commander August Willich was seriously wounded in a subsequent exchange of rifle fire. To Howard's left, Hooker attacked with Geary's and Butterfield's divisions, which is about 12,000 men at 1.30 p.m. East Division's three brigades formed a brigade column, that is, with the regiments formed one behind another. Right. However, the approach march took the brigades through dense underbrush and across ravines, which mixed up the brigades and regiments. Now, of course. Various units of uh, uh, Union soldiers emerged from the rough terrain in a haphazard way, and their attacks were repelled. Yeah, because that was stupid. Right. However, William Thomas Ward's brigade, led by Benjamin Harris's 70th Indiana Infantry Regiment, 
found itself in front of Max Van Den Corpitz, Georgia Cherokee battery, and charged overrunning their guns. Oh, though, no man. shit. Mm -hmm. These guys. Fantastic. Oh, Confederate counterattacks drove backwards, man. But John Colburn's brigade retook the guns before also being driven back. So he took the guns and then had to leave them. <laughs> right. Finally, the 412-pounder Napoleons were left in no man's land with neither side able to claim the guns. That's fine. Hooker's Corps gained no ground and suffered 1,200 casualties, including 156 in the 70th Indiana. Well, that's not good. After Johnson heard that the old federalities were no longer a threat at Lays Ferry, he ordered Hood to attack the Union left flank again. 4 p.m., Stewart's division launched its attack as per Hood's instructions. Uh oh. Now, soon after, Walker reported that the Federals were across the Ustanala at Lays Ferry again. He's like, damn it. Johnson tried canceling the attack, but it was too late. Yep. By happenstance, Stewart's brigades emerged from the forest one at a time and were badly mauled by Williams' division. Oh, my. Williams' troops lost 48 killed, 366 wounded, while inflicting 1,000 casualties on Stewart's division. Wow. Stevenson's division also lost at least 100 casualties in the botched attack Jeez. itself. Jeez. Hovey's 23 Corps Division, formed of recruits, was supposed to support Williams, but instead its soldiers hugged the ground and refused to go forward. Oh, wow. Meanwhile, at Lay's Ferry, Sweeney learned that the Confederate bridge was a false report, so he repeated the successful operation of the previous day and formed a bridgehead on the south bank. Uh oh Good for you guys. That evening, after meeting with Hood and Hardy, Johnston ordered his army to retreat from Masaka. He knew Sherman's army was fully entrenched from the Kanasaga to the Unstanala and could potentially detach forces against his supply line. Mm -hmm. He saw that Union troops at Lay's Ferry Bridgehead were a direct threat to his army's retreat route. Johnson directed his army to utilize the railroad and wagon bridges, plus the pontoon bridge. The four guns abandoned between the lines were the only equipment left behind. Look at you. That's not bad. Well, Polk's and Hardy's Corps used the railroad and wagon bridges, while Hood's Corps used the pontoon. Confederate Army passed over the Ustanala bridges by 3.30 a.m., detected only at 3 a.m. when Logan's 15th Corps skirmishers found the Confederate trenches empty. Oh. Johnson's engineers removed the pontoon bridge and set fire to the other two spans, but Logan's men saved the wagon bridge from destruction and captured some stragglers in the meantime. Union casualties at Rosaka numbered 4,000, including 600 killed or mortally wounded. Confederate losses were around 3,000, of whom five to 600 men and four guns were captured. Five to six hundred men moited. No. Uh, Captured. All right, yeah. Uh, the American Battlefield Trust and National Park Service. They both listed uh, 2,747 Union casualties and 2,800 Confederate casualties. Mm, that's a big discrepancy, huh? Right. Uh, these sources called the battle inc inconclusive and indecisive, even though... Looked like the Union got the better of it. I would say so. But nobody really took over a battlefield or gained position, I guess. So. Right. Sherman forced Johnson to abandon two tactically strong defenses positions, uh, though the Confederate Army was able to escape intact both times. Historians were critical of Sherman's handling of the battle, though. Namely, he launched costly attacks, leaving his left flank open to right. a counterattack. He failed to fire on the bridges with his artillery and true. failed to utilize the Lays Ferry Bridgehead to threaten Johnson's retreat. Also true. Johnson also mounted costly attacks, but his retreat was well-timed and well-executed. Were they? Nevertheless, Sherman managed to push Johnson back towards Atlanta and made it impossible for him to send troops to Lee. And when that was pretty much the whole thing. So I say that's a Union victory, yeah. honestly. Mm -hmm. Schoeman, he hoped to catch up. And crushed Johnson's retreat army between the Ustanala and the Etowah Rivers, a distance of about 30 to 40 miles. It is the most open country in northern Virginia. It is the most open country in northern Georgia. Because the south of the Etowah, the terrain becomes forested and mountainous again. Mm. Schoeman, he sent Garage Cavalry, followed by Jefferson D C. Davis's uh, 14th Corps Division, down the west bank of the Ustanala toward Rome. McPherson's two corps crossed that Lays Ferry to form Sherman's right wing. Yeah, Thomas' troops were ordered to follow the railroad south. 1 p.m. May 16th, Howard's corps began crossing the repaired wagon bridge and reached Calhoun that evening. Schofield's and Hooker's corps marched east. They first crossed the Conasauga and then crossed the Kusawadi River at Fields Mill before turning south to Sherman's uh, to form Sherman's left wing. Johnson retreated towards Adairsville hoping to fight a defensive battle at that location. Oh, all right. Which I'm sure we'll have, baby. Well, this very battlefield is preserved as a Rosaka Battlefield State Historic Site. 
is open Fridays and weekends. Okay. The location is 183 Rosaka Lafayette Road, Rosaka, Georgia, 30735. <laughs> American Battlefield Trust and, and its partners and its partners have acquired and preserved 1,044 acres of the Rosaka Battlefield as of mid 2023. The Friends of Rosaka Battlefield and the George Battlefield Association, the Friends, uh, created a 500 acre battlefield park along Camp Creek. Ambrose Bierce's short story killed at Rosaka. It focused on a brave staff officer who was moitered by recklessly riding into the line of fire. Oh, okay. Good for him, I guess. Huh? Well, not good for him, I guess. So down, jeez. <laughs> and that, my friends, will end another episode of this year of 1864 that we find ourselves in with... Uh, we don't go back to Virginia. Well, we are in Virginia 1 at the Battle of Newmarket. But we don't go there for a couple because we're going back to Louisiana for the Battle of Mansura. Then we go to Georgia for the Battle of Adairsville. Georgia. And then we got the Battle of Yellow Bayou in Louisiana once again oh. before we uh, make Virginia and Georgia our home for the foreseeable future. Right. And, uh, yeah. Overland campaign, Atlanta campaign, obviously the two big ones that we're uh, going to round out the year of 1864 with. Either or. I oh, I see a, yeah, about even amount of red and blue in the win categories coming up. So yeah. not bad. They they win a lot of Virginias. That's what they do. Right. Uh, yeah, we'll get all that coming up on the future episodes of this podcast that you all love and know, know and love. In the meantime, make sure you're going to check out our YouTube at Bang Dang Network. Give us a subscription comment on all of our videos all 400 and something of them and give us a like on all of them too that's why you can support us right. and if you're just listening on spotify or apple give us a review subscribe if you're available to and answer that question on spotify and we shall be back next week for some uh so some more fighting we'll see you then we are the mother music Gainers. we uh, okay.